Good morning. Thank you for joining us at the Understanding and Body Carbon and the State of Play in Hong Kong webinar co-organized by Kundo Hong Kong Limited and Business Environment Council or BEC. My name is Violet from BEC Policy and Research Team and your host today. This webinar is supported by BEC Climate Change Business Forum Advisory Group, representing one of our core environmental focus area on climate change. Now for a few housekeeping rules, today's webinar will be recorded so please feel free to revisit the content when the webinar is later uploaded to BEC's website and our YouTube channel. Participants are all muted by default. If you have any questions or comments for our speakers, please use the Q&A or chat function at the bottom of your screen and we will address them during the panel discussion. Today, we will listen from local and overseas experts who are very experienced in managing and reducing embodied carbon. To kickstart the webinar, please welcome Mr. Anthony Peck, Principal of Preopta and founder of the Carbon Leadership Forum, or CLF Vancouver, to share with us the international trend on embodied carbon management. Anthony, please. Hi there. Thanks for inviting me. Um, just give me one second to share the screen. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining today and for your interest in this topic of embodied carbon, uh, which is something that I oftentimes refer to as the blind spot of the building industry. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, first what is embodied carbon and why does it matter. Uh, then I'll go over how does embodied carbon compare with operational carbon emissions, which is something that uh, most of us are more focused on uh, and has historically gotten more attention in the green building sector. Then I'll talk a bit about uh, embodied carbon policies and standards that are uh, addressing this in internationally. And then finally, I'll go through some design strategies for how to reduce embodied carbon uh, for key materials, things like concrete, steel, wood, aluminum, refrigerants, mechanical, electrical plumbing systems, and uh, interiors. So first off, why does embodied carbon matter? Uh, when we're talking about embodied carbon, we're referring to the emissions associated with construction materials. So think of all the materials that go into a building, all the concrete, steel, glass, bricks, wood, et cetera. Um, there's emissions associated with uh, making those materials. And we're really tracking this across all the different life cycle stages. So everything from extracting those resources, you know, harvesting the timber or mining the ores, uh, all the way to transportation, uh, manufacturing and processing, uh, construction, operation, uh, all the way to end of life. So emissions throughout all those different steps for all the materials in the building. Now, if we look at the global picture, uh, this is a pie chart showing the annual CO2 emissions globally. And so about 28% of global CO2 emissions is attributed to operating all of the buildings on the planet. So to heat, cool, and operate the buildings, that's 28% of global emissions. A further 11% is associated with uh, the embodied carbon. So that's all the uh, new construction and renovations that are happening each year. That's 11% of the emissions. What's interesting is um, if you actually just look at some of the key materials that go into buildings, things like concrete, steel, and aluminum, just those three materials, they make up 22.7% of global emissions. Now, obviously the building sector doesn't use all the concrete and the steel and the aluminum. You know, those materials are also used in things like infrastructure, used in our cars, used in um, other products. But what's interesting is that if we can meaningfully impact some of the supply chains for these key materials and other materials as well, uh, they have, uh, we have the potential of impacting sectors much bigger than just the construction industry or the, yeah. Now, um, I didn't have any specific Hong Kong statistics, but uh, here are some stats that I found for China. So uh, the embodied carbon associated with, uh, embodied carbon is associated with 18%, so almost a fifth of China's annual emissions. And this is by an estimate done uh, by a recent study, which estimated at around 1.6 gigatons of CO2. Um, now, if we just look uh, specifically for the building sector, embodied carbon accounts for roughly one half of the building sector annual emissions uh, in China. And that puts it roughly on par with operational carbon emissions. And that's in large part because there's so much new construction happening every year. I think China accounts for roughly a third of the new construction uh, globally. Um, now, if you zoom out, look at the global picture, over the next 40 years, we're projected to double the current building stock. So think of all the buildings that currently exist on the planet, all the square footage, all the or meter squared of floor area. 
uh, we're projected to double that in 40 years. And so this uh, map shows you the breakdown of how much new construction is projected to take place by 2030, 2040, and 2060. And that's what those shade of circles look like, right? And you can see, obviously, China is a big chunk of that. Um, put another way, in those 40 years, that's 230 billion meters squared of uh, floor area of new construction. And that's equivalent to building an entire New York City every month for the next 40 years. So all the buildings that exist in New York City, that's how much we're building every year or every month for the next 40 years. Now, how does this map onto our climate targets? Um, you've heard a lot of talk about the limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or maybe two degrees Celsius. What that means is that globally, we need to peak CO2 emissions by last year, 2020. And then we need to get to half of the emissions by 2030, so in the next decade. And then we need to get to zero by 2050 and then go negative. So obviously, if you kind of see what our broader climate goals are to hit those uh, targets, we can see that we definitely need to tackle embodied carbon. We can't just only focus on operational carbon emissions. Embodied carbon is critical. Um, put another way to hit these targets, to hit the 1.5 degree scenario target, that means each year we need to drop CO2 emissions by 7.6% per year. If we're going for the less stringent two degree target, that's 2.7%. Uh, reduction per year globally. Uh, and to give you a sense of how ambitious that is, last year in 2020, it was estimated the drop in global emissions was around 7%. But that's with the pandemic, that's with, you know, halting a lot of air travel and a lot of uh, activity in the economy. That was 7% for this one year. We need to achieve that every year moving forward to hit that scenario target. So that's a sobering picture. Now let's, let, let's think about how does this actually look like on the scale of individual buildings. And so the key metric I wanna look at is kilograms of CO2 equivalent per meter squared of floor area. And that's how we're gonna compare operation, embodied carbon with operational carbon emissions. This is a hypothetical pic uh, picture of like emissions for a building. So let's say the building lasts for 60 years. These yellow bars show you the operational emissions. So to heat and cool and operate the building each year, there's some emissions happening every year. The red bars show you embodied carbon. So, you know, when you before the building is occupied, there's a lot of concrete, steel, and, and other materials that go into making that building. And so there's a big pulse of emissions up front. Uh, and throughout the lifespan of the building, there may be certain elements of the building that need to be replaced or maintained. And so we account for those replacements here. And then we also account for any emissions associated with the end of life. And so to quantify embodied carbon, we, we use what's called life cycle assessments. And it's kind of analogous to energy modeling uh, to quantifying operational carbon emissions during the design phase of the building. Um, this, these are the formal definitions of the different life cycle stages associated when we're doing a life cycle assessment or LCA. Uh, so module A or stage A, that's all the emissions associated with raw material supply. So resource extraction, um, transportation, manufacturing processing, and then uh, transportation to the construction site, and then emissions uh, at the construction site for construction and installation. So all that, that's called module A, and that's the upfront carbon. So that's before the building is occupied. Now, during the use phase of the building, we're looking at things like uh, any emissions associated with maintenance, repair, refurbishments, and replacements. Replacements is probably the biggest category here. Um, as I mentioned, if any components uh, reach their service lifespan and they need to be replaced, uh, we account for that. And then finally, at the end of life stage, we're looking at deconstruction and demolition, transportation, waste processing, and disposal. So when we're doing a whole building life cycle assessment, we look at both uh, the emissions from cradle to grave, so from module A to module C. Sometimes you'll also see figures reported for module D, which is uh, supplementary information. So it's information that we report alongside the main set of results, which are A to C. And this is looking at the, emission, the benefits and loads beyond the system boundary. So uh, any emissions or any benefits that may come from reusing the material at the end of life or recycling them or, uh, you know, incinerating it for energy, for example, uh, we account for those benefits here. So if you compare, if you combine that, those embodied carbon emissions with the operational carbon emissions that you get from your energy modeling figures or, or you know, when the building's in operation, actually looking at, you know, your utility rates, uh, or how much energy your, your building is using, those two pieces combined give you the holistic picture of the whole life carbon of your building. Now, historically, the thinking has been that operational carbon emissions are far more important than embodied carbon. 
Uh, but what we're seeing is that as we're designing buildings to be more energy efficient, and also as we're decarbonizing our electricity grid, uh, the operational carbon emissions decreases over time and the embodied carbon becomes a bigger slice of a smaller pie. Um, so here are some specific figures that I've found for China. So there was, a one, there was one study done in China that was looking at 191 buildings. And you can see the ranges in embodied carbon. So this is kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. It ranged from 230 to 780, with the average being, let's call it around 500. You can see the range for residential buildings, for office buildings, and commercial buildings. And you can see for residential and office buildings, this is the average split. Um, so you can see a lot of emissions from steel and from concrete, you know, concrete, steel, and some of the other material categories here. Uh, to relate it to a Hong Kong example, I saw one LCA study for uh, one Taiku place, and that was uh, pegged at uh, 578. 575 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. Uh, so very, fairly in line with these, uh, 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 this study. Uh, we can see this; these ranges also uh, correlate well with uh, some of the global benchmark studies that have been done. So this was a study done by the Carbon Leadership Forum uh, a couple of years ago, looking at a thousand buildings from around the world. And you can see the very wide range, but let's say averaging around 400, 500, somewhere in that range. Um, one Click LCA, which is a software, uh, one of the LCA software tool providers, they have this letter grade rating system uh, by different building types. So for office and apartments globally. And so you can see, you know, 500 kilograms of CO2, that's about middle of the pack around uh, letter D in this case. So that's embodied carbon. So let's say on average, maybe it's around 500 kilograms of CO2 per meter square. Uh, and this is only looking at the structure and the envelope of the building. But how does this compare with operational carbon emissions? Um, so I found this study, which is the China Building Energy Use Study. So this looked at all the buildings across China. And um, just by my calculations, the operational, the average emissions is around 34 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared per year. So this is annual emissions for operating the building, about 34. And uh, I, I've definitely seen you know, buildings that go up to 100 or even over 100 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. So you, you got to look at the specifics of your project. But let's say it is 34 uh, kilograms of CO2 per meter squared per year. That's That means the embodied carbon is equivalent to roughly 15 years of operational carbon emissions. So that's just a, a way of kind of relating the emissions. Um, and I've read a study that said the average lifespan for uh, buildings in China are projected around 34 years or so. So that gives you some sense of scale. Um, one of the big factors to keep in mind is the electricity grid carbon intensity. So, um, you know, how much renewables, how much fossil fuels you use in your electricity grid, it can vary significantly. So, you know, for example, in China, the average grid carbon intensity is about uh, 974 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So this is a different metric I'm looking at per kilowatt of electricity. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, based on this data set, and it may be old, uh, is around 790 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. I think I've seen some other estimates that are around 710. Um, but to give you some example, like in Canada, the average is around 150. And in my province in, in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, BC's average is around 12 because we have a lot of hydroelectricity. That's most of our electricity. So, so you can see there's huge ranges in electricity and that's obviously gonna affect your operational carbon emissions, but it also affects any materials, the embodied carbon, associated with any materials that use a lot of electricity. So things like steel or um, in particular aluminum, uh, that'll affect those emissions. So uh, that's a high level perspective there. Now let's talk a bit about policies and standards. Um, globally, there are many different uh, voluntary green building uh, rating systems, things like LEED uh, or BREEAM or EDGE, uh, or in Hong Kong, I believe the BEAM uh, program also addresses this. Um, and then there's also some regulatory policies as well. But this just shows you that in every, uh, in most regions around the world, uh, there are some uh, policies and standards that are addressing embodied carbon in some way. Uh, broadly speaking, I see policies and standards tackling embodied carbon at two different levels, one at the whole building level and the other at the individual material or product level, uh, which is kind of tackled at through uh, what's called environmental product declarations. And so th these are just some examples. I won't get into the details here, but um, if you're wondering what an environmental product declaration or EPD is, this is basically like a nutrition label for a building product. Um, uh, so it's saying like, what's the envir environmental impact associated with each unit of this material? So for example, per meter cubed of concrete, 
what's the carbon emissions associated with this. And so these EPDs, they're third party verified, they go through uh, ISO standards, and it avoids greenwashing because it then gives us a, a basis for comparing different um, products on their environmental uh, performance. And these EPDs can be both industry average and manufacturer specific uh, or product specific. Um, so for example, in Vancouver, we have a policy that's uh, aiming, targeting a 40% reduction uh, for all new buildings and, and uh, construction projects. Uh, sorry, a 40% reduction by 2030 relative to 2018 as a baseline. And so by having this policy target in place, uh, this has gotten many of the you know, structural engineers and architects and, and uh, developers in Vancouver very focused on this topic. Uh, other green building rating systems like LEED, uh, they also award um, a certain number of LEED points based on the percentage reduction that's achieved. Um, if you're interested in embodied carbon policies, I'd, I'd highly recommend you check out this link in this report. It's called embodiedcarbonpolicies.com. It was put on by the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and OneClick LCA. What they did was they evaluated 52 embodied carbon policies globally. So looking at things like zoning and land use, uh, building regulation, procurement, infrastructure, waste and circularity, uh, municipal buildings, and financial policies. So they looked at across all these different types of policies that can address embodied carbon, what's the carbon impact, how cost effective is it, how easy is it to implement, how enforceable it is. Uh, and they also have sample policy language um, and they cite specific cities if, if they've kind of implemented some of these policies. So it's a great resource to check out. Finally, I'm going to wrap up by talking about some of the key materials and how you can reduce emissions. You know, concrete is one of the biggest materials to focus on. It's, uh, and to, to understand the embodied carbon of concrete, first you need to understand where do most of the emissions come from, and that is cement. So cement makes up maybe about 10 or 11 percent of uh, the mass of the concrete mix, but it's uh, 80 to 90 percent of the total emissions. So think of cement as the glue for the concrete. So cement is where most of the emissions are. So if you can actually reduce the amount of cement content in your concrete, you can have a big impact in those emissions. And when you're producing cement, those emissions mainly come from the kiln. So like it needs to be heated to 1400 degrees Celsius. So there's, a, so there's emissions associated with the energy for heating it. But then there's also a chemical reaction that releases CO2 and that's about 60% of the, the uh, emissions associated with the cement. So um, there's various strategies to reduce embodied carbon for concrete mainly in terms of reducing the cement use. So for example, you can use what's called Portland limestone cement versus regular Portland cement. And so essentially they're using a bit more limestone in here and it leads to roughly a 10% reduction in uh, per meter cubed of concrete. Also, you can use supplementary cementaceous materials. So using more fly ash or slag in your uh, concrete mix and that'll displace some of the cement. And um, what you want to do is kind of max reduce the amount of cement content by each element of your building. So for example, for your foundation, maybe you can have more greater reductions uh, versus your above grade slabs versus your columns. So you want to kind of optimize it for each element of your building that you're using concrete to use as little cement as possible um, within the requirements. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these other points, but all that to say is, for example, if you look at, this is Canadian data, but uh, compared to the average concrete mix, you can get up to 40%. I've definitely seen some projects that get up to like 60 or 70% reduction in embodied carbon just by uh, adjusting the concrete mixes. So this, there's a lot of room to, to uh, reduce emissions this way. For steel, there's two main methods of producing steel, basic oxygen furnace, which is what I think is very common in China, and electric arc furnace, which is much lower emissions, typically a half or maybe even less than a half the emissions of basic oxygen furnace. So with basic oxygen furnace, you're using a lot, um, mostly virgin iron ore. Um, whereas an electric arc furnace, you use much more recycled content steel, um, up to 97% typically. And it's also an electricity driven process. So if you have low carbon electricity, that steel will also be fairly low carbon. Um, wood generally is fairly low in body carbon. Um, and it can sequester carbon. Uh, the, the main thing to keep in mind is that it needs to come from a sustainably managed forest. Uh, if it doesn't come from sustainably managed forest, the emissions could actually much, be much higher if you look upstream on the forestry impacts. Aluminum is a very highly energy intensive product. So it uses almost 10 times more electricity than steel. So um, definitely try to recycle the aluminum. And when you're producing the primary aluminum, try to 
uh, use a low carbon electricity source for pr producing that primary aluminum. Um, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, as well as interiors, are oftentimes neglected when we're doing whole building life cycle assessments. Um, and here are some estimates for the ranges in those emissions. So let's say in the medium scenario, your mechanical system, so that's like your ducts, your pipes, all that sort of stuff, that's let's say around 60 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. Whereas for tenant improvements or interiors, so things like furniture and your interior finishes, let's say that's around 90 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. You know, these numbers may not seem extremely high, but keep in mind that you're going to, how often you're replacing it over the lifespan of the building. So let's say if it, they get replaced every 15 years, those numbers can add up. And so over, let's say over 60 years, the MEP and the TI, the interiors and the mechanical systems, they can potentially be even higher in body carbon than this original structure and envelope, which is what we're, which is the numbers that I previously cited, which is what we typically look at when we're doing life cycle assessments. Uh, finally, I just want to say that uh, refrigerants is also something to keep in mind. Um, when you when there's refrigerant leaks, that can lead to very significant emissions. And in Asia, obviously, there's a lot of air conditioning units coming into play. So uh, that that is one of the biggest strategies, actually the top strategy globally, that we can use to reduce emissions. It's actually higher than even wind turbines and solar and et cetera. So refrigerants are a big deal. Um, I just want to wrap up by saying, uh, you know, I, I've started up this group called the Carbon Leadership Forum in Vancouver, and so we bring together a lot of local stakeholders. Um, since we started the first one, there's over almost 30 cities now that have started up local hubs, uh, and I would encourage uh, Hong Kong to set up something similar as well. Um, thank you very much. That's my presentation. And yeah, feel free to comment. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Anthony, for setting the scene and explaining in a broader context the big picture of embodied carbon from a technical and policy perspective, sharing with us the Canadian case and its relevance to different types of materials. So up next, let's switch our focus to embodied carbon assessment. We have Ms. Grace Lam, Environment and Sustainability Manager of the Construction Industry Council, or CIC, who will share with us the CIC Sustainable Construction Roadmap and the CIC Carbon Assessment Tool. Grace has prepared a video for her presentation, so let's welcome Grace. Hi, I would like to introduce the CIC Sustainable Construction Roadmap. We've launched the uh, Sustainable Construction Award, Carbon Assessment Tool, Green Product Certification. And this year, we will launch the Certification Scheme for Green Finance. All these projects, uh, we will go toward the 2050 Decarbonization Strategy. For the Green Product Certification, we define the carbon uh, emission factor for specific construction and building materials, such as concrete, reinforcement bar, and paint. Carbon assessment tool will uh, assess the carbon performance for construction projects. For the uh, certification scheme for green finance, we will uh, facilitate the application of green finance in the construction industry. Next year, we'll have the uh, Smart Waste Management plugin to digitalize the uh, on-site waste management system. We have incentives for all these projects, such as Sustainable Construction Award, Beam Plus, and also Green Finance. The um, Sustainable Construction Certification Scheme for Green Finance, we target users uh, include uh, construction industry and its supply chain, including project owners, main contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers. The applicant will submit the sustainability performance to CIC, and we will issue certificate for green products, projects, or corporate uh, uh, initiatives. The financial institute will offer suitable um, financial product to successful application. There are many um, green finance applications for uh, in the construction industry, such as the adoption in, of new technologies in infrastructure, new buildings, MIC manufacturing. For the on-site, there will be a solar panel, um, zero diesel generator, etc. So let's come to the uh, embodied carbons for the, um, the, the main focus of today. It includes the manufacture, transport, and installation of construction materials. For buildings uh, are responsible for 39% of global carbon emission, of which 
is from materials and construction. And body carbon are being more important and it will be responsible for half of the carbon footprint of new construction between now and 2050. In the, for the international trend in and body carbon, the World Green Building Council um, report uh, uh, the uh, embodied carbon to demonstrate the need for transparency and improvements of embodied carbon reductions. For China, uh, we are going uh, for the carbon neutrality before 2060. In London, uh, they are pioneering the regulations of embodied carbon levels. And in the city of Vancouver, it requires the uh, reporting of embodied carbon emission in new construction. For Hong Kong, we are also striving for the carbon neutrality in 2050 or before 2050. And it, we also promote the um, use of the low carbon uh, and, and body carbon materials. So for the CIC carbon assessment tool, we've launched like uh, one year ago. And it's the first online carbon tool in Hong Kong for the construction industry. It also adapts for the new buildings and infrastructure projects. The scope is to include the materials uh, for the uh, con during construction and measure the uh, carbon performance of the site impacts such as the electricity use, uh, water consumption and waste recycling, etc. So for the function, uh, we also facilitate for the low ca carbon design and construction. Uh, we'll also like to uh, develop a carbon database for performance benchmarking. So let's hear the views from the key stakeholders about the carbon assessment tool. This tool is a public-based information platform. 咁其實通過呢個平台咧，可以推動建造業減碳成績嘅不斷進步，從而咧可以配合建造業咧可持續發展。因為過去咧，誒可能真係冇一個誒好系統嘅方法咧，去量度呢一個嘅誒做一個嘅碳評估。咁啊，呢一個工具係可以幫助到業界就住誒唔同嘅誒建築工程啦，佢哋有一個統一嘅方法去計算呢一個嘅誒碳嘅。碳嘅足跡咁樣樣啦，咁亦都可以咧，係當你量度到嘅時候咧，就可以 set 到一個 benchmark 咧，俾唔同嘅 project 咧去做一啲嘅 reduction 嘅 target 咁樣樣嘅。咁誒呢個工具咧，最主要就係可以幫助到咧，將好多大量嘅數據咧，去形象化同埋具體化咗佢啦，製造出啲圖表咧，去協助企業咧，容易啲清晰咁去制定一啲減碳嘅目標，從而提升到企業嘅競爭力嘅。作為一個承建商咧，我會喺投標啦、規劃、設計同埋施工階段咧，去運用呢套工具咧，去幫我確認一啲碳排放嘅熱點，所謂 hot spot。而針對呢啲熱點咧，從而發展出一啲低碳嘅方案同埋採納嘅方案。作為一個公營嘅機構，我哋市建局咧好開心可以參與到建造業議會呢個試點計劃。有咗呢個碳評估工具咧，我相信咧。業界咧可以好容易咁為項目制定一啲減排嘅目標。咁當然我哋作為一個物料供應商咧，啊，如果能夠誒更加支持到我哋嘅客户，甚至乎係發展商進行依家低碳採購嘅話咧，咁呢個絕對會係一個競爭嘅優勢。We've got over twenty two hundred. Registered and active projects that are using the carbon assessment tool, and in the tool we have over 500 materials for selection, such as the structural steel, uh, facade aggregates, etc. Um, the tool is already integrated with Beam Plus new buildings version 1.1 and 1.2. Uh, we have free credits if you use the tool. Uh, if you demonstrate the material use for permanent works which have low uh, embodied carbon and also uh, demonstrate a full embodied carbon assessment. This year, we hopefully we will integrate with the Beam Plus new version, uh, version 2.0 as well. So uh, for the World Green Building Council, uh, they published an Asia Pacific embodied carbon primer last year. Um, the carbon assessment tool is also mentioned in this uh, primer 
and we, we showcase the uh, carbon performance in here as well. So for the way forward, uh, we would like to have the benchmarking um, of the uh, carbon assessment for this uh, construction industry by project types. And also we will provide trainings in Hong Kong Institute of Construction and professional institutes. We will continue to expand the um, local material database. And finally, we will um, provide some recommendations for public and private work specification. So thank you for listening. That's all for my presentation. Thank you, Grace, and your sharing on the international trend of embodied carbon and how the carbon assessment tool is being adopted and utilized along the construction value chain. May I now invite our next speaker, Mr. Jeremy Pong, Director of Steel Wing Steel Limited, to talk about the use of steel in low embodied carbon construction. Jeremy, please. Thank you. Come on. Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Just a little bit of history about Shewing Steel. It was founded in 1958, and the original plant was located in Zhang Bay. The company installed the first automa automated rolling mills in the late 60s. And in 1979, we installed first electric arc furnace, we call it EAF. And in 1990, we installed a second year F. The plants moved to Hoon Moon in 1998. And Shewing is the only steel mill in Hong Kong, and we have the only license to install a new year F. What is steel? Steel is an alloy of iron and carbon containing less than 2% carbon and 1% manganese silicon and other materials. Steel is one of the most widely used materials in the world. It is a core pillar in construction. Reinforcing bar, reinforcing bars, rebars are one of the most commonly used steel products. Steel is 100% recycl recyclable. Scrap with oops, about 630 million tons of scrap. Scrap is an industrial term for used steel, a recycle every year. What is that in con in, put in context? The entire aluminum industry produces 60 million tons per year. So the recycle part of the steel industry is 10 times bigger than the aluminum industry worldwide. And steel is the most recycled materials in the world. How do you make steel? There are two ways to make steel. It can be produced from iron ore or from scrap. Integrated mill uses iron ore as a raw material to make steel. For the mini mill, scrap is the raw material. But both routes is energy intensive. I mean, steel making is a very, uh, it's an energy intensive uh, industry. This is the flow chart for integrated mill. Cooking coal, iron ore, limestone are charged into the blast furnace. Add natural gas to ignite the chemical reaction and pick iron is produced. Iron ore basically is iron oxide. So the blast furnace removes the oxide and add, add carbon to the iron. The, the product, pick iron has a very high carbon content, typically about three to 5%. The next step is you put your charge of pick iron together with scrap in a ratio of about 75 to 25, 20, 75% to 25% into the basic oxygen furnace. Oxygen is then blown into the furnace to reduce the carbon in the molten steel to less than 2%. The molten steel is then further refined in the refining furnace. After refining, the molten steel with the desired chemical composition is cast into billets, and these semi-finished products will be reheated in a reheat furnace, then rolled into reinforcing bars. This is a minimal electro arc furnace flow chart. It's very simple. It's more. It's actually simpler than the uh, basic oxygen uh, blast furnace, basic oxygen uh, production route. Scrap metal is charged in the electro arc furnace. Um, the electricity 
the energy for electric arc furnace is electricity. The electrodes in the EAF creates an electric arc, and the heat generated by the arc melts the scrap. The molten steel is then further refined in a refining furnace, or you call it well, a ladle furnace. The molten steel with the desired chemical composition and is then cast into billets, reheat in the reheating furnace, and then roll into reinforcing bars. Now, this is a comparison of the two processes. The downstream process, the casting, rolling, and operation are identical. The difference is in the steel making. In 2018, 72% of the steel produced worldwide is from integrated mill, and 28% from mini mill. And then you can look at, because of the nature of the energy, um, the CO2 emission for making one, one ton of steel in the integrated mill ranges from 1.98 to 2.77 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And for electric arc furnaces, it's around, could be from 0.4 to 0.93 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, a huge difference. Uh, in some countries where you have, you use a lot of hydro, hydro electricity like Norway or new, primarily nuclear like France, you can actually drop that number from electric arc furnace steel making up to 0 0.1. Okay, in Hong Kong, the ratio of reinforcement arc consumed pr produced by integrated mill is about 83% and the remain reinforcing bar produced from EAF. Hong Kong consumes around 1.3 million tons annually, um, reinforcing mass annually. So if you look at embodied carbon, just from the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace produced reinforcing bars, is about 2 million tons versus the one, uh, 200,000 tons of uh, embodied carbon produced by EAF from the EAF route. So if you switch, if you switch Every single reinforce all the reinforcing bars used in Hong Kong to from um, blast oxygen blast furnace basic oxygen furnace uh, production to EF production, you save around a million tons of embodied carbon. Okay, this is a typical construction project, a government housing project. The design is they call it New Harmony One design. Uh, 40 levels, 800 flats, um, about 33,000 meters square of uh, GFA. Now, if you just use standard concrete, standard uh, and rebars from blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace, the embodied carbon is about 23,000 tons. You make play around with the materials. If you switch the concrete to the concrete that emits less greenhouse gas during production, you can reduce the embodied carbon by about 17%. Don't switch the concrete. Switch to reinforcing bar make from EAF using 100% scrap, you reduce the embodied carbon by 24%. Do both, it's a 42% reduction. Now, this is a commercial building with retail and office space. I think this is one Peking Road, uh, 43,000 meters square of GFA. The result actually is quite similar. You, 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 you switch the, 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 the um, to a green, so-called greener concrete and, and, and reinforcing bars. Uh, if you do both, you, it's about, also about 43% reduction in, in embodied carbon. Now, circular economy is probably the way forward for sustainable development. And steel is an ideal materials in a circular, circular economy. Two, two properties that makes it unique. One, it is magnetic. This property makes it a wonderful material for recycling. You can easily separate it and collect it. I mean, you don't have to separate at a source. As long as you can put a magnet at the entrance of, of, a, of a landfill, you can still collect the steel. And the other thing is you can infinitely recycle steel because it's not, a, it's not an element. It doesn't have to be very pure. You have 2% carbon, as a mixture of it. So you can recycle and recycle and it doesn't damage the physical, uh, it doesn't do any, changes the physical property of the steel that much. What's the next step? What is our embodied carbon reduction strategies? There are two ways to look at it. One is you can start from the planning and procurement side. You know, you buy low carbon materials, low cost, low cost sourcing, and you 
be more efficient in terms of construction um, uh, planning. From, for the architects and engineers, you can optimize the design. You use high strength concrete with less, um, with less CH, GHG um, during production. You play around with the reinforcing bar types, you know, maybe use, use bigger bars or for less tonnage or use different type of design um, or combination of concrete and, and, and reinforcing bar to use less concrete, less reinforcing bars. So reinforcing bar produced from EAF have at least 52% less in body carbon than the, those produced through the blast furnace, the basic oxygen furnace. And recently, we received, we received two procurement orders with this requirement. At least 70% of the steel shall be manufactured by EAF production routes. And the steel shall contain at least 70% by weight of recycled steel content against the total weight of the product. So my last question to end my presentation is, is your peer already one step ahead of you in reducing and body carbon? Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for your concise overview on different types of steel making technologies and how they contribute to embodied carbon reduction. This also set the scene for our next presentation, moving the angle from materials to construction. We're pleased to have Ms. Edma Harvey, Group Sustainability Manager of Gammon Construction Limited, to share with us the challenges and opportunities of decarbonizing construction. Over to you, Edna. Thanks, Violet, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to continue a little bit from, from what Jeremy was saying and just highlight some of the challenges and opportunities associated with reducing embodied carbon. Under the two topics of materials and construction activities, we know that is um, the key part of the upfront carbon. So I've just uh, picked out some key highlights. First of all, looking at exactly what Jeremy was just talking about, optimizing material usage and designing with lower carbon materials. Um, we're hoping to see that there will be more use of um, lower carbon design uh, iterations at the design stage, and then looking at alternative materials in terms of um, uh, lower carbon uh, embodied carbon materials. In terms of material efficiencies, obviously reusing existing materials is a wonderful way of using less carbon, but uh, not always the easiest solution. And I looked at this, um, a this uh, report recently for C40 cities, Hong Kong is one of those cities, and they were looking at a, a trajectory going towards 2050, uh, the, the one and a half degree target trajectory. And they identified that material efficiency is gonna provide the biggest um, savings. So it really is the way forward um, in terms of, uh, of reducing embodied carbon. And what we'd, we'd love to see is more um, collaborative uh, working and using carbon as a lens through the LCA that Anthony mentioned to design out carbon. And of course, we can also design out cost at the same time um, to make sure we're using uh, materials as efficiently as possible and also considering after use flexibility for adaptation and disassembly. We have the wonderful carbon assessment tool already available for us to use, um, which is a wonderful tool that we've been using as well to help us with some of the designs where we do have an influence. We don't always have uh, influence over design. And here's a couple of simple examples. One is foundation design for a commercial project. And exactly as Jeremy was saying, you know, playing with the numbers, playing with the materials and balancing concrete strength with rebar to get um, the carbon reductions. Another example, again, on the infrastructure side, um, looking at just one part of a, of a road tunnel um, uh, design, uh, we were able to save another thousand tons um, through that design process. So it is possible, and there are very um, sophisticated tools out there to help us make sure we are using the materials and the geometry and the loading um, efficiently to make sure we're, we're standardizing as much as possible. Uh, we've also got to make sure that the building regulations allow us to use some of these tools um, and allow these, uh, these types of designs to be approved in the future. The second part then, um, lower carbon materials. Uh, I'm just focusing on supply chains, concrete and timber. 
Um, and I think the, the interesting part from this, this report in particular from the World Economic Forum looks at eight different uh, supply chains which was, are responsible for 50% of the emissions. And of course, the construction sector is there as well. And this report looked at the cost of carbon abatement. This is for the construction sector. And I think what's interesting to see here, along the, the bottom axis there is carbon reduction. Um, and then on the left-hand side is the carbon cost. And it's showing that basically we could achieve 40 to 50% um, carbon reduction in the supply chain of the construction sector um, with very little or no cost. So um, change is needed, but the costs, the end, end user costs are likely to be quite low um, in terms of the impact on the supply chain uh, carbon reduction. However, there is a lot of uncertainty. This is a McKinsey report um, for the cement industry, the decarbonisation of the cement industry. And that long blue bar there, um, three quarters of the way down, is new technologies. So it's relying, the cement industry is relying on the presence of new technologies. The, the UK concrete and cement industry has also identified these new technologies. And it's really relying on carbon capture usage and storage. Um, that yellow box there, 61%. And there's a lot of uncertainty over that and a lot of cost involved in that. So um, yes, it's possible. Hopefully the costs won't be too significant, but we are relying on something that there is a lot of uncertainty over. And that is why reducing materials um, is, is a key part of the story. Um, and as Jeremy mentioned, there are opportunities for reducing carbon in concretes. Um, we can use further um, reductions in cementitious materials, but we've got to be able to have um, flexibility in specifications and regulations. And there has to be surety of supply of some of those materials like slag. Um, of course, timber is, is going to be something that we'll, I think we will see coming soon into Hong Kong, especially since the, the change in building regulations um, certified Sustainable formwork is obviously available and easy to use. Uh, we'd prefer not to be using timber formwork, um, but this is what's really exciting. The mass engineered timber, glue lamb, cross laminated timber, already projects built up to 18 stories um, and more planned to be higher. And the lighter weight material then allows us to reduce things like foundations, it's got wonderful offsite construction um, opportunities as well. The second part then um, is looking at the construction activities and reducing the carbon from those on site. Um, and this, uh, I think to put this in context, just share with you our own carbon footprint. So this is um, Gammon's carbon footprint. We use ISO 14064, which is why you see the categories rather than the scopes, but they're pretty much equivalent one and two. The big blue um, part on the right hand side is diesel. So we've got to really tackle the diesel. And on the, uh, on the left hand side, category four is uh, landfill, temporary works, materials, water and wastewater. And if we break that down, then temporary works, materials, um, structural steel is a major part of that. And on the, the left hand side, the gray part, Landfill disposal is another very large part. Um, and then we've got some um, concrete uh, as well. So that making up most of the, the impacts in terms of our scope three emissions. So those are, those are the ones that we can influence um, and how are we going to do that then? Uh, we see the use of BIM and collaborative um, data environments, obviously digital tools um, as the key to um, solving some of these problems and off-site construction as being the way of delivering those construction um, projects. But we've got to make sure that that starts early, that there is enough lead time. Um, it is going to provide us with opportunity, as with benefits, even when we include the factory um, related impacts. This is a study from the UK. Um, not a lot of projects are, um, uh, built yet in Hong Kong, so not a lot of data available yet. Um, but we, we do see opportunities there. And I've got the chat box, so my PPT is not 
forwarding. Can you close the chat box, please? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's not working now. There we go. Um, uh, and this is our, our project from, it's not a typical project, obviously it's quarantine facilities, um, but even compared to a mixture of our completed residential projects, high and low density, uh, big savings there in carbon intensity, waste intensity and water intensity. So demonstrating that the, this is really the way forward. In terms of using uh, energy on site, um, we started with the uh, B5 biodiesel, but really it's better to avoid diesel entirely. And that's why we're really promoting um, electrification, that we can take advantage of the decarbonization of the uh, electricity grid and then other um, fuel types in the future. Why electrification? Well, it's not only the decarbonization of the fuel, um, of the energy mix, but um, also air pollution. It is, you know, it is very nasty having these diesel generators going on our sites um, for our workers and our construction uh, staff. And of course, we've got noise impacts as well within the community. And that's why we've been supporting BEC with something called the Power Up Coalition. Um, this is echoing um, the spirit behind the technical circular released by government about early electrification. And the, for the, that's for the government work site. So what the Power Up Coalition is doing is promoting um, early electrification, having sufficient electricity on site before construction starts, and then working towards zero emission construction sites in the future. Having enough electricity on site allows us to make use of these kinds of power sources, the, the mass battery energy storage uh, entertainer here with the associated carbon reduction benefits. Longer term, we're, we're keeping a close eye on the market in terms of electric plant and equipment. It's very slow coming to market. It is very expensive at the moment. Um, so we do need to, to keep that on the, uh, on the horizon and look at replacement plant in future. Again, having the electricity connection allows us to do things like this. So connect to renew, um, renewable energy into the grid um, and help uh, contribute towards decarbonizing Hong Kong's electricity uh, and other technologies in the future. So it could be hydrogen fuel cell, uh, it could be other lower carbon fuels. Um, you know, we, we, just we just don't know yet, but electrification is definitely the first and most important step. Uh, already got a few members for our Power Up Coalition. We launched that in, in early, uh, sort of mid-April. So we're really looking forward to working together, working out the most um, appropriate way of, of easily facilitating that early electrification. So to wrap up then, what are my four main points? We've got to reduce materials through smarter designs and collaborative efforts. We've got to identify the use of lower carbon materials. We need to be off-site as much as possible and enable that through digital tools and BIM. And then we need to have and work towards zero emission sites. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma, for your comprehensive presentation on embodied carbon reduction strategies and the examples of how these strategies are being taken in place. So let us move on to the panel discussion, which will focus on the industrial experiences in tackling embodied carbon. Again, if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to type your questions using the Q&A function. May I introduce our moderator for today, Mr. Jonathan Yao, Associate Director of Kundo Hong Kong Limited. I'll now pass the time to you, Jonathan. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for all the speakers. Uh, it's very inspiring and, uh, and very helpful information. Uh, so we have 15 minutes. I just want to uh, quickly understand, uh, say, uh, the practice internationally. So we might get some insights from Anthony, and then we can talk about some local issues in Hong Kong, and then we can move to the Q&A. We've got lots of interesting questions um, um, from, from, from our audience today. So um, let, let's start with something from a more global perspective. Uh, perspective. We have a very special guest, Anthony, from Canada here today. Um, so Anthony, you are the uh, founder and director of uh, Canada Leadership Forums, right? And there are like 25 uh, leaders from Network. Uh, operating the world. 
what is what they doing? Uh, it's the region. Uh, what, what, what is that key strategy to reduce the body carbon? Could you share a bit more information with us? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's there's many uh, there's I think maybe close to 30 cities now that have started up these local carbon leadership forum hubs. And, you know, the main thing is, you know, because embodied carbon is a relatively new topic for m many people in the industry, I think it's really helpful to actually have a dedicated organization to focus on uh, pro like developing events, focus on this. So definitely many of the local hubs have created many events. You know, they start off with an embodied carbon 101 type of presentation, you know, quick overview. But once you actually get into the landscape of embodied carbon, there's so many subtopics, so many things to tackle. So many of them are focused on events. Some of them have actually created working groups as well. So maybe they're, they're trying to advance some specific aspect, for example, policy. So like the Boston, uh, CLF Boston has engaged a lot of the local city officials and, and just other stakeholders in the industry to kind of create a working group to help inform Boston's policy. Uh, you know, in Vancouver, we're also doing some work uh, on the policy front as well. So. Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes there's some member-led initiatives. Sometimes some of the groups are creating case studies as well. So there's a wide range of different things that the groups are doing. So it's basically um, lots of knowledge sharing and policy application. Sounds really good. So, so and what it can has become a really hot topic in Hong Kong this year. My new CIC been organizing lots of events, webinar, uh, promoting it. Raz, can you share a bit more? How, what is the strategy of CIC in terms of reducing um, and what it covers in Hong Kong? What is the plan? Sure. Actually, the challenge that Hong Kong facing is that it's similar to uh, what Anthony said before. Um, and what carbon is, of course, our core strategy for CIC to tackle. Uh, in a few years ago, we set out the sustainable consumer roadmap that we have mentioned in our introduction part. Um, we strongly believe that uh, both technical incentive and financial incentives should work come together to accelerate the decarbonization process, uh, including the embodied carbon. For the technical incentive, uh, uh, as we have mentioned, uh, we launched our carbon assessment tools, uh, provide a common platform for the industry to measure their carbon performance and, and know how to manage it. And for the second step, we all we will. Uh, uh, work with different professional institutions and, and our college to provide some uh, regular training to build up the capability of the industry. And for the uh, financial incentive, I think um, green finance is one of the topics we should focus on. As you know, the home government uh, announced in the recent policy address, um, they would put, they would want to position Hong Kong as the um, green finance hub in Asia. And um, as a uh, concern sector is the major contributor of the GDP and also the division uh, in Hong Kong. And we have lots of opportunity to access green finance. What CIC is now focused on is want to build up the ecosystem of green finance so that the consistent sector can easy to uh, access. Through developing the certification scheme for green finance, uh, we want to drive the uh, concern stakeholder to do more low carbon construction method and use uh, less uh, carbon materials. In return, they, they can enjoy the financial benefits of green finance products, such as uh, lower interest rates and uh, bigger loan size amount. We believe that uh, more and more successful, successful case will came out from the uh, SMEs and also the startup company of green suppliers once the certification scheme has been launched. And of course, uh, we are also looking forward to more policy and strategy support from the government to uh, drive wider adoption of green finance in the finance uh, consumption sector. So, so basically, CIC um, not only providing a tool, but also provide training and also to uh, use green finance as a vehicle to, to help people to become right? So that sounds very good. Um, I, I know um, the Finance Bureau, uh, pretty like a few weeks ago, they, uh, they just issued a technical um, guide about site electrification. It's also trying to decolonize the site emissions. Um, maybe Alma, you know, um, can you share a bit more information uh, about this? Yeah, so um, from uh, the, the technical circular covered uh, early electrification and water supply as well and also promoting um, EV usage on government construction sites. Um, so this means that from February, from tenders issued from February of this year, 
um, it, early connection of, of water and electricity is required as a pre a pre-construction activity. So that means that when a contractor comes on site, they have up to 400 amps available to, to, uh, yeah, to start immediately. So it can reduce the number of diesel generators for sure from the very beginning. Uh, possibly on smaller government sites, you know, wipe, wipe them out entirely. So that would be, that would be wonderful. And, and that's for public works only. Public works only. Uh, okay, I understand. So, so, so it sounds very positive, right? In Hong Kong, I don't know how to start, but we have you know, CIC pushing really hard for training, education, with finance, uh, we have the development bureau uh, issuing travel guidelines. Um, and, and green material is also a big part of it, right? So, so generally, uh, you mentioned the magic green rebar, you know, cuts how much like two thirds of carbon emission just by changing the specification is. No brainer. I think yeah, lots of people will be very interested in that and keen to use that. But they might have a concern. They will they really want to know are they actually more expensive? And if we go to say if we say put green weaver in a kind of process, are we going to get free suppliers and get stable supply for the um, supplies in Hong Kong? We share a bit more with this. Okay. Steel unfortunately steel is a commodity. Okay. It has a worldwide bench in terms of its how much you can sell for that product is determined by the market. And the, the thing is, let's take Hong Kong as an example. I mean, all the reinforcing bar in Hong Kong has to meet the CS2 standard. So you have to meet that standard before you can sell the, the bars in Hong Kong. So the pricing is determined by who can supply that bar at a given time during uh, when you do the procurement. And as I said, worldwide, I said twenty percent of of uh, steel produced worldwide is from the extra up firm to do. And out of that, actually, out of that twenty eight percent, I think about seventy percent of those uh, steel products are bought. So there's not a lack of supply. And at any given time, it's, it's, you have three suppliers or four suppliers in Hong Kong to supply those yeah steel. It's a matter of whether when you make the procurement, you specify it. In early enough when you make the purchasing, so they have it in stock to deliver. It's a matter of because you don't you, you don't buy one or two thousand tons per ship. When the ship comes in, we're talking about forty thousand and fifty thousand tons. So the the, the, the the supplier has to have need to have in their mind. You know, if you're rapidly purchasing a certain volume, reinforcing bars from electro art furnace manufactured by electro art furnace, they can plan ahead. And they can do 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 the. Uh, uh, the logistics, plan the logistics, and supply should not be a problem. Right. So and normally, you, you can't, you, you, it's the product, you cannot, you cannot differentiate the products from the manufacturing process. There actually is, there may be a little bit of freedom if you make a quick order, a uh, short term. But if you make a regular, long term procurement, I don't believe there would be a significant difference in price. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm saying is that uh, bringing back the cost control. And all they need to do is just add the green in the, in the specification, and there we go. That. So I, I really thought uh, that's Hong Kong. We, yeah, there's, there's some, sorry to jump in. Um, we, we do need to, to make sure the message that we need the green bar is go and, and enough green bar to mm. make, it the, make it worth the, the stockists and the traders working the wire. There's got, we have to create that demand in yeah. order for them to say, oh, okay, there is actually demand in Hong Kong. Because Hong Kong's purchasing power is you know, almost insignificant <laughs> when you look at the global steel market. So, in terms of the enforcement bar, we are quite significant in terms of consumption right. because of the building regulation. We have typhoon. Yeah. You will never see building using that much to get many enforcement bars. And we consume 1.3 million tons a year of the enforcing bars a year in Hong Kong. So if you say you switch to 40% switch to EAF production, it's quite significant. Right. If the supply is really, yeah. uh, it's quite significant in terms of your purchasing power. If we can, yeah, if we, if we can get it specified, yeah. I think that's the, the important part. That it's not enough of, our, of the project proponents, whether it's government, whether it's private sector, asking yeah. and specifying and requiring that. that so, 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 so I think I'm going to end on I mean, the technologies are there, the supply are there. 
But it's, it's a bit tricky, kind of thing, right? If you if nobody asking for it, like the supplies wouldn't be by stopping them, you know, because no one might want it. So if, it's, if as long as you know people start ordering it, you know, supplies getting it ready, and it shouldn't be something that difficult, right? And the price is <laughs> <laughs> and the price, you know. <laughs> um, so I can um, it's it's come to a very interesting point, right? Like, so uh, there's so many things can be done, like uh, from assessment to we have tools already, uh, we start seeing training, you know, there are policy, and uh, there are technologies like all those electrifications of power storage, and we have green bar, we have low carbon concrete. But then, why they are not yet commonly seen in the Hong Kong construction industry? And what will facilitate greater adoption of these low carbon construction methods? What's your thought? Maybe say, Shut up. Yeah, maybe I'm um, not. I think. Um... I think that we do need to look at our procurement process, uh, yeah. the contractual procurement process. Um, and I think we need to start designing and bringing in these ideas into the design process and bringing them in as early as possible. If, um, you know, if, if a, low carbon, a low carbon approach is just asked for the contractor, you're not going to get much. You know, it's got to come in, you're going to get, make the biggest differences. At the design at a specification level, Top down. yeah, to, to a certain degree, and involve the contractor, yeah. So, early contractor involvement, collaborative approaches, make sure we're using full BIM coordinated design because we're not seeing that yet on all projects. So, we do need to bring these, I think, start with the design and then we'll make some significant changes. Um, and then we can we can uh, you know fall in with the other technologies as well. Like, well yeah. So offsite construction, it needs to there needs to be enough lead time. So, so you mentioned about uh, start looking at and putting carbon uh, uh, since these are starting station, right? And uh, I, so Rex, I, I got a question for you. Um, so I know B society been adopting the um, CIC assessment to in that we process assessment, right? Yes. What does that mean to the design process and how, how is that going to help to change the situation in Hong Kong? To be honest, it's very strong driving force for the client, engineer and consultant. The thing about the low carbon design at the early stage of the building life cycle, I think uh, design optimization is a good point we, we can discuss. Uh, Emma and Jeremy has already given an example on that. I can uh, give more example. Um, we have a specific function uh, in our carbon center tools for the design stage process. Uh, the user can uh, compare to design option and, and identify which one is uh, using less materials or are using same amount of material with less carbon emission or lower cost. So that is a very important decision making process to, uh, to uh, adopt low carbon design. So I think it's a good starting point. And of course, uh, because it's just uh, integrate the carbon centers in the BIMPAS, we will work with uh, BIM Society to provide more online training uh, for the BIMPAS uh, BIM professional so that they can uh, easily adopt the safety in their uh, daily operation. And we, can, uh, and we heard that there are increasing number of uh, uh, developers has specified the use of safety in their uh, West contract and require the contractor to report the GHG emission in monthly basis. I think it's a good trend and more uh, development will follow as the current governments already mentioned that uh, they want to achieve carbon neutrality before 2050. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Government can play a key role in this, in this whole process. I mean, the biggest user, the, well, the biggest contractor in Hong Kong, actually, mm -hmm. or the whole thing state, bridges, highways, such things. If they start looking into the procurement strategy, mm -hmm. put Low and body carbon into materials requirement into their contract. That will change the entire landscape of the material usage and consumption in Hong Kong. So I think what oh, Jeremy, uh, you, you made a really good point, um, and that's also actually one of the questions raised in Q and A uh, is that what do you think Hong Kong governments can do to drive uh, the consideration of body carbon? And uh, you've mentioned uh, we can look at the procurement process. And Emma mentioned we need to drive it from the design uh, perspective to start with and then work collective together. Um, Anthony, you, you've got more experience internationally. Could you share a bit more with 
that's what, what, what the other governments in the country are doing in order to reduce that carbon. Sure. Yeah, I think the biggest thing would be um, so th what Vancouver did was, uh, I think back in 2017, they implemented a requirement where all the new rezoning projects, uh, which makes up about 50% of the new construction in the city, all of those rezoning projects needed to do a whole building life cycle assessment as part of their rezoning submission, which is very early in design. That's like schematic design stage, right? So um, just by having a disclosure requirement, not saying you need to reduce a certain amount of percentage, that already built up a lot of industry capacity by having a lot of the local design firms start looking at how to quantify and calculate this. So I would say that's the first step. Put in some requirement to require disclosure, whether it's at a municipal level or maybe it's a progressive client, uh, an institution or a, a building owner, like put in that requirement to disclose first. Then the other thing is the city could potentially set a target. So give a roadmap to the industry. So for example, Vancouver, they're saying 40% reduction by 2030. So if you could then give that roadmap to this to the industry, I've seen a lot of clients say, well, what does 40% mean? So then they're starting to think about what that looks like even right now on their projects. And so, you know, set it at disclosure first and also say, give them a roadmap for where it's gonna go and that will help the industry move. Yeah. So, so, so basically um, requesting uh, data disclosure, I don't expect it, right? Um, uh, there's also one very interesting question I think we need to touch on uh, turn into your brain from, from experience. Um, there's one question asking, um, when it's come to quantifying um, uh, the carbon saving, can we use BIM BIM as a tool uh, for managing carbon? What's your experience and then what? Is there any tools available that can do it? Yeah, no, I think that's definitely, they go hand in hand together. So um, BIM tools are, uh, I mean, it, basically when you're doing a life cycle assessment, the most, the, the key piece is how much materials are you using, right? And so the, the BIM model can potentially provide that information. Now, mind you, you know, sometimes that information isn't like fully there in the uh, BIM model, depending on what stage of design you are in. So you'll need to also think about what is reflected in the model and what's not. But there are some LCA software tools like OneClick LCA uh, and also Tally that that have that. Um, and I would encourage you know CIC if, if potentially look at how to integrate with some of the the BIM tools as well because that would be very helpful. So I think uh, we're running out of time, but I just want to ask one last question while we have all the experts here. Um, uh, there's a gentleman asking a very good question. Say, like, what percentage of materials used in Hong Kong? Would have an EPDs and environmental product declaration certificates. Can we have answered by materials? Like? So, do you, so anyone can help answer this question in terms of we building materials certificates? Is it a, a company available in Hong Kong or what's your experience in that? We've only, I've only ever come across one or two. To right. be honest with you, yeah. okay. And the EPDs, yeah. so it's not free. It's not being It's not common, but we we do have the the local CIC green product certification, which does include a carbon emission mm -hmm. uh, factor. So, um, but it's not it's not very widely used in the, in the market yet. I think uh, there's quite a few things like paints and sealants and tinners and a lot of concrete mixes from, from ourselves and others. Um, and yeah, not yeah, sure. Fine. Okay, there you go. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not covering of our suite, and you also get things like curtain wall. You know, it's it's made up a lot of different of a lot of different um, components. So uh, it's not an easy thing to do for something like that. Yeah. But yeah, they they sh they should be more. Yeah, I think um, it's uh, we've got a tools, we've got a policy, and the next thing we need to get is we need to get to certify so that um, we get professional. Decision um, so we, we had a really, really good discussion, uh, but I'm afraid to go. Uh, I'm just caught up time, so I think uh, I would say, I'll say thank you for all that mixed up here today. And uh, before we run up the Q&A session, uh, I think I would like to pick up about a good vulgar session, right? Yeah. Uh, so maybe we should move our way to the front of the stage for everyone. <laughs> and, uh, uh, our cameraman, I'm sure we're getting um, Anthony in the screen as well, if possible. Uh, we'll have the uh, panel. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Maybe Simon should come as well. Okay. Well, first. Okay. Um, <laughs> could at least see Anthony's smiling face. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. All right.
ทั้งบอกนี่ว่าสร้างagain to our panelists and Jonathan for moderating the discussion. This also concludes the webinar. An event feedback questionnaire will be sent to you after this webinar, so please feel, take a few moments to fill in the form. If you're interested in to know more about future BEC events, please follow our social media channels. Thank you again for joining us and have a nice day.